All right. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome, I'm Jennifer Miller. I'm a librarian in the Adult Services Department at the Scotch Plains Public Library. I'm very pleased you can be here tonight. Uh, this is one of those programs that we definitely would have had to cancel if we, yes. were, doing this, if we were doing this in person. Uh, so it's one benefit of the, uh, the virtual world is that the show can go on Blizzard or no. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome our speakers this evening. We have Matthew Ritter and Zachary Rittner. They are both um, biology teachers at Scotch Plains Fanwood High School. Not related? And uh, no, uh, Joan, let's, um, they are going to have a lot of great information to share with us. So we're just gonna let them go ahead and get started. All righty. Uh, thanks everybody for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Matt Ritter. I'm a uh, biology teacher at the high school. I also teach uh, zoology and uh, forensic science, and I'm uh, happy to be here tonight with my colleague, uh, Zach Rittner. Do you want to quick introduce yourself too? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Zach Rittner. Uh, historically, I've been a biology teacher at SPF uh, HS, but uh, this year I'm really more focused on environmental science. So I run the AP environmental science program. This is the fifth year of that. And uh, right now I'm helping to lead the, uh, the first year of academic environmental science, code name ACES. But um, it's been a really fun experience so far and I'm, I'm really happy to be here tonight to talk about the Great Backyard Bird Count with uh, Mr. Ritter. Nice. And uh, again, thanks Mr. Rittner and thanks to the Scotch Plains Library for inviting us today. Uh, if at any point during the presentation you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either of us. Our contact emails are at the bottom of the page here. Uh, we just ask that you remain muted uh, throughout the presentation. I believe that the uh, presentation is being recorded. Um, so if you miss anything, you can always uh, check out the recording at the end of it. So uh, the purpose of this, of this presentation here is to uh, discuss a little bit about backyard birding basics and get everyone all set up for the great backyard bird count, which will be occurring in just a, uh, just a couple of days time. So we don't need the timer, let's roll. All right. So why birding? Uh, let's get a little bird brained here and talk a little bit about the benefit of birds uh, for, for everyone. So I found this quote when I was creating this presentation. Uh, I don't need birds because they need me. I feed the birds because I need them. And uh, I, I found this to be strikingly uh, poignant, especially during the uh, quarantine when I had gotten back into birding. So uh, the, the trials and tribulations of life kind of got away from me a little bit and I lost, uh, lost some of the passion I used to have in, in college. Uh, I would go birding. I did a couple of research projects, uh, took ornithology, the whole, the whole, um, the whole scheme there. And over the quarantine, I really got back into it. Um, there were a couple of times that Mr. Rittner and I would, uh, we would socially distant, uh, go hiking, uh, and check out some of the bird populations in the, in the local area. So uh, Mr. Rittner is going to be really good at, uh, at talking about some of the local areas, and I'm going to defer to his expertise on that. He usually drags me along with him uh, on a lot of the adventures. So uh, birding is a really, really great way to bring people together, and especially in these times, it's, it's a good way to, to engage with our community. So what is bird watching? Uh, I'll start here with the basics. Uh, in bird watching, you are uh, observing the different types of birds that you see. Um, but it's so much more than that. It's also observing the behaviors of birds. And this is something that I've personally been really engaged with recently in examining how do birds interact not only with members of their same species, but also with some of the other birds that are around them as well. Um, a cool thing to observe too is how these birds change over time. So looking uh, just uh, even between day to day or checking out how birds change during the seasons, uh, you've got the migratory birds that are coming back and forth. How do bird populations change? And then uh, something that is really amazing too is listening to the sounds of the birds. So we're gonna share a couple of resources with everyone here tonight on how to become a better birder by ear. It is a challenging thing. Um, I find myself particularly not musically inclined, uh, but those that, uh, that work at it can certainly succeed at birding by ear. And it's really a great talent. So uh, Mr. Rittner, do you wanna talk a little bit about benefits of bird watching? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things we talk about in environmental science all the time is the concept of an ecosystem service. And this is something I'll tap into again later on in the presentation, but ecosystem services refer to the different processes, whether physical or abstract, that um, intact environments and, and ecosystems can provide to society. 
And so there's different categories here. There's really four major categories of ecosystem services, but the ones that we're describing here would really be kind of focused in more on a cultural service, these sort of um, ethereal, non-material benefits that intact ecosystems, and in this case, wildlife can provide to society. And so there's a lot of really interesting and novel research that's come out in the past couple of years referring to the actual emotional and psychological and health benefits of interacting with nature. And that can certainly include backyard bird watching. Um, one of my best friends, his, his brother uh, actually just graduated with his PhD degree uh, doing research on using Twitter, believe it or not, and kind of uh, taking using with Twitter as a pulse to get or to get a pulse, I should say, of people's emotional well-being after spending time in nature. And sure enough, he found that people tended to be more hopeful after spending time in parks and other, quote, green areas. And so bird watching is a natural extension of that by spending time in nature, um, whether that's literally going out into a forest or a park nearby, uh, like Brookside, for example, or the Fanwood Nature Center, um, or if you want to get more exotic, go up to Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge, but, or if you just look out your window, however you choose to participate in bird watching, um, one of the major benefits there would be you're tapping into these cultural services. Contact with nature certainly is going to benefit uh, your mood and psychological well-being, your mental health, and even your cognitive functioning. And I think that's something we can all use uh, in, in today between the pandemic and uh, the blizzard of 2021. We just can't seem to get a break there. <laughs> but certainly in an age where I know that uh, Mr. Ritter and I are, are talking about this or are being talked to about this all the time at the high school and in education, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on social, emotional learning and status, not just for students, but for staff and everybody else. This is a great way of kind of tapping into that and being able to kind of pause, breathe, and really connect with something that's, that's real and tangible and has this sort of abstract benefit uh, on us. And there's, there's some, some links there we'll leave you with in case you're interested in, in reading more about the different scientific studies uh, into those different processes, but it's a really, really beneficial sort of thing to just spend time in nature um, to kind of improve your social emotional status, if you will. Yeah, and at the uh, at the conclusion of this, we'll follow up in a couple of days with uh, with a copy of the PDF version of this presentation, uh, where you'll be able to find the links for uh, these resources. So, Mr. Rittner and I have, have spent a lot of time compiling this. Um, so, a lot of our sources that we that we pull for this information is from Cornell, Audubon, and other associated uh, scientific-based uh, research. So, how do we get started? All right, first thing you got to do is find a window. Okay, it's the easiest thing. We're all comfy, cozy inside right now. Um, find a window and start observing. It's a little hard right now because it's, it's dark out, but come come <laughs> come tomorrow morning. Um, at, at the at the crack of dawn, you can start to observe your your birds coming out with the dawn chorus. Um, you can get access to a guide, and guides come all in all shapes and sizes. I'll talk a little bit about some paper uh, versions as well as some of the digital resources that are available for free. Uh, the information era here has afforded us a lot of technology that we can use to quickly and accurately identify uh, our avian friends that we observe uh, in our own backyards. Uh, you'll want to invest in some binoculars and gear. Um, you can get some pretty uh, inexpensive gear uh, pretty quickly. Uh, if, if, especially if you're a beginning birder, you might not want to invest in the $500 pair of binoculars and something much cheaper might be a little bit uh, more effective for you. But if you find that this is a hobby, a pastime that you truly enjoy, investing in that uh, more high-tech gear can be beneficial. We'll, we'll give you some resources to connect with some local birders through the Audubon Society and the Cornell Ornithology Lab. And we'll give you some recommendations to become a morning person, which is uh, definitely me. And uh, who we've got here on this, on this slide, I'm not gonna tell uh, who all the birds are because we do have a little activity at the end to practice using some of the technology. But this was my uh, springtime like golden find. This is a peleated woodpecker that came back behind my apartment. Um, while I was sitting outside reading one day, I happened to look up and there he was. So I was able to capture him with an amazing, uh, with an amazing shot and he's been my like prized uh, visitor. So there he is, Peleated Woodpecker, amazing, amazing bird. Okay, so what do you need to get started? First thing, backyard. 
So um, Audubon Cornell recommends giving yourself distance and giving yourself time to set up. Uh, I, I did a bird list this morning that I'll share the results with you. And I did not have any real visitors come to my feeders until approximately 25 minutes after I had settled down. So they can see you even if you're in a window. And once things stabilize, the birds will come. You just have to give it, uh, give it time and be patient. You'll see as we go over the rules for the uh, uh, great backyard bird count that they, you are required to sit and observe or stand and observe or move and observe for at least 15 minutes. So it does take time for these things to uh, settle down and let nature kind of take back over. Feeders help. There's tons of resources that we've provided for, uh, for everyone here on how to make either recycled uh, bird feeders to make uh, at home suet cages to uh, uh, pine cone feeders, anything in between. So there's tons of resources out there that we can feed the birds and, and uh, minimize our, our footprint as well. Right. Finding the perfect guide. Um, there are a number of different types of guides that you can get. The Sibley Guide to Birds and the Peterson Guide to Birds are some of the uh, birding world's favorites. Uh, they're, they're spectacular guides. There's, there's no question about it. Um, there's also the National Geographic, which is usually on sale at Barnes & Noble. So if you're a new birder, you can get it relatively uh, cheap if you can find it on the uh, discount rack with some of the bargain books. Uh, I like using that out in the field because it's a hardcover book. It also has uh, indented tabs, so I can quickly thumb to a, uh, to a bird that I need to identify. It's really rated well in the field, uh, but every guide has advantages, every guide has disadvantages. Um, you can learn more by clicking the links there when, when you have access to the presentation. And then digital, digital uh, guides. Now these you can all download on your phone. Um, if, you, if you are interested, we're gonna do an exercise at the very end of the presentation. Um, we, we would advise that maybe you try downloading the Merlin Bird ID app. Uh, it looks like this guy over here, um, the one on the left. You can also download the Audubon app, which has the, uh, the great egret there, the one in orange, and then iNaturalist is another type of app as well. Uh, Mr. Rinder, I'm going to throw you on the spot here, but do you want to you talk a little bit about iNaturalist and maybe talk about Seek for a little bit? Yeah, I was going to jump in if you, if you didn't call on me. So before I talk about Seek, though, um, I, would, I would like to just also offer up for the Audubon app. This it happens to be probably my preferred app, which I know is not Ritter's preferred app. I think he likes Merlin better, but that makes sense because as the Council of Ritz, it's important that we never agree about anything. That's kind of the running joke. So I like the Audubon app, um, particularly because it has, you know, it has the same information as the Merlin Bird ID, but I like it because of the interface particularly for someone who's not as, as well versed in birds as myself. I know Ritter is, is much, much more knowledgeable about bird species. It has a, a special little feature that allows you to kind of input generic information about the bird and give you a list of the most viable candidates for that. And when I was in freshman biology last year, working with my uh, academic students, that was something we found tremendously helpful. Even the AP, uh, even my APES students, the AP Environmental Science kids, found very helpful when you're out in the field and you don't have myself or Mr. Ritter to kind of be like, "Hey, what what is that exactly?" It's a nice, helpful feature, and I think it's very user friendly, particularly for the more novice um, user. Uh, but getting on to what I'm supposed to be talking about, you know, Seek is a is a newer app that Ritter really turned me on to, and I've been having my AP kids play around with it. But essentially. It's another really great tool for someone who's less confident in identifying different bird species. Um, the trick is you get to use your camera on your phone and the app will actually, you know, take a picture of the species. But it doesn't need to just be birds either. It can be a uh, reptile. It can be a, a plants I've had a lot of success with. But it will actually take a picture and then using its database, it actually has algorithms to tell you what that species is. It's not perfect, but it is a really, really cool, useful tool, especially one for free. But that is Seek, S-E-E-K. I like that one a lot, Seek, S-E-E-K. But again, it's made by iNaturalist, it's free, and it's another part of a citizen, uh, citizen science project. 
So the more data that we are inputting into it, the more experienced the computer, the algorithm becomes, and the more effective the software is at identifying the species. So you don't get instances where, you know, maybe you just put point your camera at the ground that sees a rock and says, hey, you found a gopher tortoise. And it's like, no, I definitely didn't, but nice try. But it's a really, really great one if you're if you're interested in trying to get out there and you're perhaps a little bit, you know, wary of, of, of um, your particular expertise level. I, I certainly encourage us to uh, everyone to download that as a fourth option would be seek. And I and I like oh, when I when I go to a new location, I'll go and I'll, I'll scan around with iNaturalist. Uh, it's, it's very similar to seek. It's, it's made by the same company. Uh, but what they do is, again, you take a picture of it and it'll run through the database and then pop out recommendations. And that does go into a larger database and other observers um, are able to participate and confirm or deny some of the suggestions that, that you come up with. I know there's been times where I've been spot on and there's been times where I've been dead wrong. So it's part of the process and making mistakes, as I'm going to talk about a little bit later in this presentation, is absolutely crucial to learn. So uh, everyone has something to learn from somebody else here. Oh, there it is. There it is. Second, second bullet point. All right. So what do you need to get started here? Uh, you need a desire to see birds. And that, that's all. That's why we're all here tonight on this on this snowy evening. We want to we want to learn how we can give back and we can we can start to, to learn the birds. Uh, you have to have a willingness to make mistakes. Uh, I didn't get to where I'm currently at by get, being right all the time. I followed other birders around. Um, I would go with other birders in college that were at the same level as me. And you always try and go with someone that's a little bit better or a lot better than you. I did the uh, Christmas bird count a few years ago and I was with um, like amateur ornithologists. And I thought, I thought I was like pretty good. I went with some amateur ornithologists that just blew me away. They were unreal. Um, they were able to make, um, to identify owls. They knew like where the owls were at. And we're, this is at like three in the morning with a, with a boom box walking around owling. Um, but they were, they were spectacular. And I, and I walked away um, not feeling ashamed of where I was, but feeling like I had really accomplished something and learned some new uh, tricks of the trade that I could share with others. So there's going to be times where you make mistakes, you shake it off and, and, you, and you move forward with it. Now, uh, in terms of binoculars, I'm not an expert on binoculars by any means. Uh, I will use whatever is in front of me. I usually keep a pair in my car in case I need to make a pit stop. If something cool uh, I see kind of fly by, I'll pull off safely and, and observe it. Uh, but I usually try and stick with an eight by 42. Uh, it has a really uh, cost-effective balance uh, with an eight times magnification and a 42 millimeter diameter of a lens. It allows a lot of light in and will help uh, really uh, show the, the, the specimens that you're trying to observe. The general rule of thumb is that the bigger difference between the magnification and the lens diameter is going to create a sharper and brighter image. Uh, you'll have to, you know, experiment with a couple of binoculars as you get more comfortable before you're ready to really commit to something. Uh, I'm currently rolling around with a, a 10 by 40, which is the first time I've like actually like carried around a 10 times magnification binocular. It was very strange at first, but I, I, I've grown to like them a lot. So we've again included the links to that. And if you uh, end up after tonight signing up for uh, Cornell's uh, newsletter or Audubon's newsletter, they're constantly releasing new information of, of new binoculars. Again, you don't need the $500 pair as a, as a starting out person. Just you know, get out there and, and use what's on hand. All right. Um, what you can see here, I, I, I did this. I did a very similar presentation for some students at the high school a couple of weeks ago. And uh, this is what I usually walk around with in my in my car. And I just quick pulled it in. But there's my uh, there's my pair of binoculars. I like to go around with a field, uh, not a field guide, a sketchbook. So I can sit down on a, on a rock or a log and just wait and then do some sketches. Uh, I'll show you some of my, my fantastic artwork a little later in the presentation. At least I think it's fantastic. Uh, don't forget a water bottle. Uh, make sure you stay hydrated. You should wear a hat, bring sunscreen, uh, composition notebook or a notepad. I carry around these little composition notebooks uh, with the lined paper on it. So if I don't feel like going completely with, a, with using the, uh, the sketchbook, I can still take notes as I sit there in a, in a really compact way and then upload my results to eBird later. Now eBird is going to be the, um, the central location where we're gonna be depositing our data for the great backyard bird count. So we'll walk through how to create an account there. There's a number of different ways to input your data. Uh, you can take it out on paper first like I do, or you can walk around with the app open on your phone and we'll actually trace the route that you walk on as you put data in there. Um, I still tend to prefer to do uh, the 10 to 15 minute um, standing in one spot before putting the data in uh, as opposed to walking around, but it's a personal preference. Everyone, you'll, you'll develop your own over time too. 
So, uh, Mr. Ray, do you have anything to add here? Did I forget anything? No, I think I think you hit it. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, setting up your birding spot. Uh, this is a view of my backyard in the uh, in the summer there. So I've got a whole lot of different types of bird feeders out. I've got uh, a house feeder, suet feeder, tube feeder. Uh, I think there's a hummingbird feeder in the back there somewhere. There's definitely a thistle feeder uh, in the back too. So I, I get a really, really wide array of different birds in my backyard. Um, one of the things to really be mindful of is giving yourself enough space. Uh, bird feeders are recommended to be at least 30 feet away from your home to help reduce collisions. Uh, and again, the link that I've included there on this slide uh, also designates that window feeders can actually be quite useful in reducing um, damage from window collisions as well. They cite that because the feeders are so close to the house that uh, the birds really can't damage themselves um, by colliding with the window because they're like right there. It's kind of like accidentally walking into a wall or something. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt a little bit, but it won't cause extreme damage. Keeping the feeders closer than 30 feet increases the risk of damage to the bird by window collisions. So um, there's tons of resources online. If you do have birds that are colliding with your, with your windows and things like that, it's an unfortunate, it's an unfortunate problem. And I, I hear about it quite often. Uh, there's, there's different remedies that are out there, but keeping your feeders as far away is usually a good way to help reduce that. Uh, make sure you change your feeders regularly. Mold, especially on those thistle feeders, can be absolutely damaging um, and it can make your birds sick. Uh, make sure that you, uh, yeah, you, che you change and clean them regularly. It's, yeah, regular feeder maintenance. Good stuff. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the different feeders that, that, I, that I like to use. I got a tray or platform feeder recently. Uh, this is great for attracting tons of different birds. It, it hosts a number of different types of food that you can provide for them. I like to put um, peanuts and I like to put uh, sunflower seeds in. Um, so the, uh, the, the birds can just land there. Uh, it's nice. There's a drainage basin on the bottom of it. So we reduce the uh, risk of mold and, uh, and parasites. Not, not really a problem there. The, the real problem is that it attracts other animals. So you don't want to like overly fill it. You want to make sure that it gets cleaned out uh, every day or two by your birds so that you don't end up attracting uh, uh, undesirable animals. I, I personally find squirrels to be quite cute but uh, most people don't like them at their feeders. And uh, so making sure that you're, 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 you're providing the food just for the birds that you want is, is going to be helpful. Uh, next up, we have hopper or house feeders. Uh, I do have a house feeder, but I didn't like the birds, uh, the bird pictures I had. So I, I just used a tube feeder with a, with a squirrel protective cage on it. it. It doesn't help. This, this one did not help. The squirrels just hang upside down and they just do what they're going to do anyway. And I, I've, I've come to terms with it. It's something I had to accept. Uh, but this is nice. These hopper house feeders, they, they look like little houses. Uh, some of them can put suet cakes on the side of them. They're, they're really fancy and ornamental. It helps protect the birds against weather and the bird droppings just kind of um, will, will fall off to the side or if there's a bird on top, the bird droppings will just stay on the top of the roof and not really hit the, um, the seat underneath it. So it is helpful there. You get good uh, variety of birds, but again, squirrel magnets. So I think that's going to be, a, it's going to be a theme that we're going to be seeing a lot here. Squirrels are going to be coming over like crazy. All right, tube feeders, great for attracting tons of birds again. Uh, you want to make sure that you have a lot of uh, a drainage so that they be cleaned. It is a bit more squirrel resistant because there's not as many places for them to, uh, to hang on to it. But as this picture shows, absolutely not impervious, not one bit. So this guy is just having the, the time of his life on that feeder. Uh, I believe the, uh, there's some seeds stuck to his nose. Yes, there is. It, that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, the suet feeder is one of my personal favorites, and you get all manner of, uh, of birds with suet feeders. Uh, you can get suet cakes uh, pretty much anywhere. You can get them I, I, um, when, I'm, when I'm like really, really, really running low and I need a suet feeder. I can get them from Acme. You can probably get them from ShopRite. Home Depot is good. Christmas tree store usually has them pretty cheap, uh, so you can get suet feeders there. Uh, but you can attract chickadees, woodpeckers, nuthatches, jays, uh, juncos. Cardinals will even eat from it, uh, all, all sorts of things. It's really great. You, you can even try out new types of them too. So they come in like berry, they come in peanut, sunflower, uh, all the different flavors under the rainbow are available for your birds. You just try some out, you figure out eventually which ones they like, which ones they don't like based on how long they sit in the suet cage. So as it turns out, my birds do not like the sunflower one. They have, it has been there for two or three days, but a peanut uh, suet cake will be gone within hours. So they know, they, they have preferences, it, it's, it's kind of fun. All right, uh, this one next, we have the Niger or the thistle feeders. 
Now, usually these are kept in, in bags that you can buy. Um, I was talking to my father earlier today and he uses an old sock as a, as a, as a makeshift thistle feeder. You know, it works, right? Uh, these are really great because um, if you wanna attract goldfinches, which is our state bird, um, they love it. So go, go crazy. You can get the little socks, the, the, the actually designed socks at Home Depot and they're like 99 cents to $2 or something like that. Uh, the problem is that that Niger seed is really expensive. So I bought one bag of it, but it goes for a really long time. You just wanna keep it sealed, uh, keep it protected. If you start to see mold, throw it out. This is one that you really wanna watch uh, because the seeds are so small, um, unless you have crowds and crowds and crowds of finches, uh, it can take a while for it to go away. So I wouldn't recommend starting off with a whole uh, tube feeder or a whole mesh net full of this stuff because it could go to waste. You could get some mold buildup. So just for this one, if you're gonna try it out, use a little bit, see who's coming to the feeder. Uh, as, you, as you might expect, some days, uh, sometimes you'll put a new feeder out and you'll, you'll attract somebody. Other times it can take weeks to get um, the right kind of bird to uh, come to your feeder. So patience is key uh, and trying out different food types is gonna be something you wanna give a shot to. All right, ah, yes, hummingbird feeders. Uh, now is not the time to find hummingbirds, but it's gonna be soon. Uh, you can make your own nectar. Um, there's, a, there's a link here. It's actually very easy to make. It's about a quarter cup of sugar per cup of water to make it. Uh, and I tried out some, uh, we have wildlife cameras at the, at the high school that we, that we got with, uh, with some, with some, I think it was grant money or leftover money or something, but we, we have these wildlife cameras and I tried one out over the quarantine and sure enough, and I hope this can play. I had a, I had an evening visitor, uh, come to my, my hummingbird feeder. I would never have expected, uh, but I think it's a really cool thing. So, um, you can usually get wildlife cameras pretty cheap, um, and try it out and, you know, see who comes. Right, uh, different types of food. There's all the different types of food. Um, there's a list there in the link. Uh, try different things out. Uh, sunflower seeds come in a variety of different forms. You can get black oil or striped sunflower seeds. Uh, safflower is. I, I personally don't use safflower seed. Um, I just I just never really tried it out, so I never grew attached to it. Uh, the Niger or thistle seeds good for the finches. Suet cakes an absolute must if if you're asking me. Uh, peanuts um, are great and then cracked corn if you can find it as well. Just try out different foods and see what, what, what works. If I could hop in for one Absolutely. second, Mr. Ritter. Of course. So one thing I just want to add while we're, while we're talking about setting up bird feeders and picking out food and stuff. One thing I know that I kind of struggled with when I was first setting up with this stuff last year and, and, and years prior uh, we have to remember that anytime you're putting out a bird feeder, there's always a bit of a time delay. You know, you can't expect that if it's Saturday, you want to do some Saturday bird watching. I would not anticipate putting out a bird feeder and necessarily having uh, visitors immediately. Oftentimes you want to try and get that out there and then a few days and in, 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 in anticipation of an upcoming event. So, for example, with the Great Backyard Bird Count, that's happening uh, February 12th through February 15th. So obviously there's a blizzard at the moment, but once that passes, that would be an opportune time to start putting out your bird seed um, because number one, it takes the bird some time to actually find it. And then you want them to kind of become habituated to it so that they re recognize there's food there. They maybe attract some other birds into the area and there's gonna be a little bit of a delay between when you put that out there and when you really have a thriving community of birds visiting for you to kind of uh, to watch essentially. All right, so connecting with other birders, uh, the two big societies or uh, groups are the Audubon Society and the Cornell Ornithology Lab. Um, they both complement each other very nicely and will partner occasionally for certain projects, uh, but both uh, both organizations are there to protect birds, uh, to increase um, awareness of birds, and to provide opportunities for people to learn more about birds. So uh, the links are included there. You can become a member of the Audubon Society and the Cornell Ornithology Lab for a, a nominal fee, uh, and the money will be used to help the causes that they have identified. All right. And um, the last little basic item here is becoming an early bird. Um, so most birds are most active in the morning. And for a lot of people, this is, this is kind of the challenging or maybe the turnoff of, of birding is how early they, they recommend you get up to see the birds. 
Um, you have to work around their schedule. Uh, you'll certainly see them during the day for sure. They'll come out, but in the morning when they're, when they're first waking up, when they're hungry, um, that's the best time to be out there, especially in the spring and the summer when it gets a little bit warmer. Uh, it's really nice. It's a little bit cooler out in the morning. You, you pull up a chair. If you have like a little bit of a blind spot in your deck or something, you just sit there and you wait and they'll, they'll come and it's really, it's really relaxing and it, it's a really good experience. So just uh, try and set your alarm before dawn, uh, if you're especially when you're out early, because you want to be out there when when the robins start calling in the in the morning. Once once they start calling, it's probably a little bit too late. Uh, you want to be like out in the field as that's happening, and you can really go uh, any time in the morning. But if you're going to get it super early, that's that's the key there. All right. So now what? All right. So you've got your bird feeder set up. You got seed. You're up early. What do you do now? All right. And there's tons of different options. It's a really it's a really plastic. Um, uh, hobby. You so many different things you can do. So you can just sit there and casually observe. You can become an extreme birder and you go all over the place and you conduct uh, big years and things like that, or big days. And there, there's tons of events with that. Uh, you can participate in citizen science projects, which is why we're here today. We're going to learn in a few moments about great backyard bird count and what that means to be a citizen scientist. If you're on the creative side, uh, you can nature journal, you can draw, you can paint, you can write poetry, you can write prose. There's so many different options. And again, with the information age, there's so many different content creators out there. Um, there are prominent ornithologists. There, there's, there's just naturalists out there that want to share their love of what they do with the community. And you, you seek these people and they're willing to, uh, they have a lot of free content on there. You can always buy content and support them as well. Uh, but just engage with nature. Um, you know, good stuff. All right. Creating an eBird account. So eBird is going to be the uh, website that we're going to want to use to, uh, to do the Great Backyard Bird Count. So uh, you can just type in eBird.org in your internet browser, and you'll be able to sign up there. Um, you can upload your list directly to it, or you can actually uh, walk around with the app, the eBird app, and you can take data as you, uh, as you move around. There's also a little addition too, and you can see each day the real-time submissions to this database. Uh, it's it's kind of cool. There's a map of the of the United States, and I, there, I think there's other countries as well that you can watch the list come in as the day goes on. It's really cool. But eBird is going to be the centralized location where citizen science is going to be happening, at least for birding that we're interested in. So, uh, Mr. Ritner, I believe you're going to talk about citizen science in a in a slide or two. But I did provide screenshots of how to create an account. Um, I'm not going to, we're not going to like pause and wait for everyone to, to kind of go through this. Uh, once the recording is there, you can walk through and see the, see the slides a little bit more clearly. And you also have access to the printout as well. It's super easy. I think it took me three to four minutes to, to sign up. Um, I have the locations for you uh, to click. So you get to eBird, uh, you'll click sign up. It'll take you to a screen where you can create your uh, Cornell lab account. So you put your first name, last name, uh, create a username. Um, create a password, put your email address in, and then you create your account. All right. Uh, they will send you a, uh, a confirmation email, so you won't be able to do anything until you confirm that. So I walked through this. I created a, an account with my school email um, just for this, for this presentation here. Uh, so they sent me an email. It was, of course, in my spam folder, so watch out for that. Once you activate it, you can start collecting data almost immediately. All right. Um, when you first log in, it's going to ask you to set some parameters up and you can change these parameters at any time, um, especially as a, as, a, as a beginning birder, you would want to have your uh, common names selected first. Uh, every bird uh, out there has a scientific Latinized name uh, as well. Uh, it makes the hobby a lot more difficult if you sort by scientific names. So I, my suggestion is to keep it uh, with the common name and then your display name. Um, sometimes, depending on what your settings are set at, uh, your name could be attached to your, uh, your submission. So if you don't want your name attached to it, you can click on the anonymous eBirder. Uh, I've got no problem knowing that Mr. Ritter submitted a uh, list from the high school. So I will leave my name up for this, uh, for this information there. Now, um, you're ready to start actually birding. What do you do? There's three steps that you'll want to follow here in order to begin. The first thing you'll do is set your location. So for this example, I used uh, the high school. So all I did was I found that uh, the answer a region box and I typed in the address for Scotch Plains Fanwood High School and I hit enter and it popped up with a map right there. And you can see uh, that I was gonna take it at Scotch Plains Fanwood High School. Now, what was interesting was uh, I never saw this before, but you can uh, claim things as birding hotspots. 
Uh, while there are tons of grackles and uh, there's a couple of killdeer and stuff in the backyard, it is not a birding hotspot, uh, unfortunately, but it is a place that you can see some birds. So once you've chosen your location, you hit continue and uh, you'll be on step two. For step two, you enter the date that you're, you're submitting your list and you'll enter the information of uh, your observation type. So were you moving around? Were you standing uh, still? All right. Um, where was it a historical site uh, or not, it's not a historical site, a historical entry. Uh, so while birding may have been your primary purpose for creating your list, um, you weren't able to, you would have to estimate um, the start time duration distance uh, for that. And then incidental is just like, I didn't really mean to bird, but I accidentally birded. Uh, so I like me may have seen like a really cool find and it wasn't your primary purpose, but you still want to log it, especially if you see a rarity for an area. Uh, that's when you would do an incidental list. All right. All right. Uh, again, once you once you go with that, you'll be able to put in more specifics. So I did a list this morning uh, from my from my home. So I started at 720 in the morning and I went for 40 minutes. Uh, party size of one, it was 25 degrees Fahrenheit, overcast and snowing. Whenever you create your list, I always advise that you keep track of your, your weather, um, the, oh, the, the um, I guess the light availability, things like that. Anything that's interesting, uh, write it down. It, it can't hurt. All right. Uh, after that, you input your birds and there's lists. They're sorted by category. So uh, your, your go-to beginning item there is waterfowl. Uh, it goes down through birds of prey, owls, um, jays, magpies, crows, et cetera, et cetera. And um, if you're doing it on a computer, command F or control F to find the bird that you're looking for can end up saving you a lot of time uh, so you can search uh, manually. Before it will allow you to, to submit your list, you'll need to, uh, you'll need to affirm whether or not you are completing a, uh, submitting a complete checklist or not. Uh, nine times out of, I guess I say nine and a half times out of 10, you're gonna be submitting a complete checklist. The website does uh, let you know about when you wouldn't want to uh, submit a list, but a situation that I've never come across one. So I've always submitted a, a complete list. So you can read more about that if you're interested on why you wouldn't submit a complete list. All right. And uh, so I have two sample lists when you're done. This was from uh, December 17th, which was, I believe, our first snow. And I have it there as a as an actual um, uh, comment there. So the last time that we had a, a, a snow day, uh, I was able to bird from home. It was, again, 25 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a nice coincidence and overcast. On the uh, 17th of December, I saw 10 different species of birds over a 20 minute period. So it was a pretty it was a pretty bustling day for my for my backyard. Uh, you can also add media to your list as well. So if you get a great picture of a cool bird or something, feel free to upload. If you hear them calling, upload it. You know, it can't hurt. It all goes to a database and it can be used to help support birds. All right. Uh, this is my list from today. So you can see my, my terrible chicken scratch on the left side of the screen there. My notes are a little nonsensical, but they work for me. So uh, I saw what eight juncos, uh, two white-throated sparrows, six song sparrows, black-capped chickadee, Carolina wren, two tufted titmice, uh, two jays, and two cardinals. Uh, went from 7.20 to 8 o'clock, 25 degrees, snowing, overcast. I did note that it took about 25 minutes uh, for the birds to settle down from my motion in the window because I was birding from my window today. Um, they were not having it. As soon as they landed, they, they flew away until I was finally like still enough to let them like go about their business. So um, that's a, it's a good day. It's a good day for birding. All right. Um, I think, Mr. Rinder, this is my last slide and I'm going to let you take over. Sure. All right. So citizen science projects, there's a ton you can do. Great backyard bird count. Again, the reason we're here. All right. So that's February 12th through Monday, February 15th. Christmas bird count is a full day's worth of birding. And that event uh, in 2020 ran from December 14th through January 5th, 2021. There are global big day events where you would go birding with a team uh, or by yourself uh, for a full day. Um, there's Project Feeder Watch. And then there's more. Uh, there's tons more of smaller things that are that are listed there at the link. Um, all right, Mr. Ritter, you're up. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ritter. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about you know why citizen science is important. Um, citizen science is one of those things that's really really important um, to me personally and pedagogically. But um, the idea here is that citizen science projects, you know, there's not really a great definition for them, but at their core, they're any sort of scientific practice that in, is involving everyday citizens, amateur scientists, if you will. 
And it's a really, really important component. It's one that's becoming increasingly important uh, in today's age. And it's also important to me because it's at the core. I'm in the I'm in graduate school right now at Montana State University. I'm getting a second master's in environmental science, and my thesis is going to revolve around citizen science, specifically the great backyard bird count and how the bird communities of Scotch Plains and Fanwood are doing in the face of COVID. Yeah, COVID's not impacting the birds directly, but my thesis or my hypothesis is that um, because more people are stuck in the house because of uh, COVID, there's been more backyard bird feeding and backyard bird watching. And as a result, uh, the bird populations are higher today than they were last year. But um, the benefits of citizen science are, are pretty profound. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, I teach environmental science. And in that course, we kind of talk about two unifying themes in that class. Um, the ideas of environmental externalities and environmental equity. Um, an externality is a is a uh, an idea that I've kind of co-opted or has been co-opted. It really wasn't me, but it's been co-opted from economics. And essentially, it's a market term that says that there is a mismatch between the price of a good and its true cost. And so in environmental science, we talk about how the use of environmental resources can sometimes generate spillover effects. And those spillover effects can be positive or negative. So an example of a negative spillover effect with environmental resources would be something like pollution. You know, a factory polluting the landscape um, that obviously, you know, is impacting the surrounding communities and lowering health for the surrounding uh, populations. But on the positive side, we can also think about ecosystem services and things like, um, you know, the benefits that birds provide to our communities, which I'll talk about more in a moment. And with environmental equity, we're talking about the fairness of the use of environmental resources. You know, do all communities, do all populations and demographics face the same risks with environmental resources? And so I think citizen science taps into both of those concepts, uh, externalities and equity, in a really impactful way. So in the, in the first instance, right, we can talk about the positive externalities of citizen science. At its core, the main philosophy for why you'd wanna participate in a citizen science program or why that's being developed is because at the, the idea is that you're crowdsourcing data collection and data analysis. So the Great Backyard Bird Count is an example where we're crowdsourcing data collection. Sometimes you'll see that uh, we're crowdsourcing data analysis. Um, I was listening to a podcast from The Wild with Chris Morgan. He was talking about how they actually use um, criminals in a state penitentiary to review thousands, I mean, we're talking millions of individual um, instances of wildlife cameras. You know, they have to review all the, all the footage and they use the, um, the, the uh, inmates, they volunteer for this, it's a great program to kind of go through all of the DNA or all through all the uh, video evidence to see where different wildlife is popping up because it's simply too much for the overworked state staff to go through it on their own. So those are two different ways you can kind of approach uh, a citizen science project. But the real benefit here is that you're able to increase um, your observations. If you go back oh, a slide. Thank you. Uh, you're able to increase the amount of data that's being collected. You're improving your research base. And perhaps most importantly of all, you're spreading awareness and building trust in science. Uh, the data is pretty clear here. Citizen scientists are not gonna be as adept at collecting data as a professional scientist. And that's okay. That's really not the point because this kind of is a good segue into the really the secondary purpose of citizen science projects. And it really taps into the idea of environmental equity by having uh, citizens and stakeholders participate in the scientific process, you're providing opportunities for those stakeholders to have involvement in scientific research and in policy making. Um, you're improving their understanding of scientific practices and their faith in the scientific you know, method. And of course, you're also promoting a sense of stewardship which all translates to environmental equity. You know, more people are involved in trying to act as stewards of the environment and promoting the health of the environment. And so if we go to the next slide, we can see some of the real benefits that we've been able to do over the years here. 
you know, this is a, an example of citizen data that was collected through citizen science from Project Feeder Watch. Um, you can see we started in 1989 to 1990, and we can actually flash, uh, flash forward to 2015 and 2016. And we start by talking about these are northern cardinals, and we have all of this great data to really monitor those bird populations. And in the next map, we can see that we did kind of the same thing with these evening grosbeaks. And again, we're able to go back decades through decades amount of, of, of data to really monitor what are the long-term impacts uh, that these uh, different populations and species are illustrating. Um, so this kind of ties really well then into some of the benefits of birds. You know, I mentioned earlier the concept of ecosystem services. You'll see in the on the right there, those are the four categories I'd mentioned previously. We talked about cultural, but at the core, you have the supporting services that enable all of the environment to even exist, the ecosystem to kind of stand up. So um, we can also think about regulating services that provide balance with the, within ecosystems and provisioning services that provide physical goods to society. Birds provide a number of ecosystem services. For one, they help to improve biodiversity. You know, that's a, that's a supporting service. Um, the more biodiversity in an ecosystem, the more stability it has, the greater the level of ecosystem services, and the greater uh, adaptability that ecosystem can have in the face of change. And on top of that, birds provide a number of really you know, economically important services, things like pollination, being able to pollinate different crops and flowers. They aid with seed dispersal for plants. They also provide pest control services, taking out, you know, through in insectivivory. Uh, I'm not sure I said that right, but they eat, they're insectivores. They're able to eat insects and other problem pest populations, keep them under control. They're even considered ecosystem engineers because of the types of nests that they're able to build, which can go on to form homes for other organisms. And in terms of cultural services through ecotourism, you know, backyard birding is a major, major industry. According to the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, a survey in 2016, they found 45 million participants in backyard bird watching that year. And that contributed roughly $80 billion, billion with a B, uh, to the economy of the U.S. It's a, they're, they're a really, really big part of our society and our ecosystem. So it's a, it's a really cool opportunity to kind of take a look at that. And additionally, kind of tying back to the two maps we were looking at a moment ago, they're also an example of what we call an indicator species. We can use birds because they're sensitive to environmental changes to kind of gauge the overall health of the environment around us, especially in an age dominated by human impact through things like pollution and of course the dreaded global climate change. Uh, if we could jump to the next slide, Mr. Ritter. Yeah, uh, do you wanna, we wanna quick go through the, the history here and then uh, Mr. Ritter, do you wanna talk about the rules for it? Cause we are, we have about 10 minutes left. Sure, yeah. sure. So um, real quick here, uh, history of the Great Backyard Bird Count started in 1998 by the or uh, Cornell Ornithology Lab. It is widely regarded as the first online citizen science project. Uh, again, like Mr. Rittner so eloquently described there, it's going to help us gather data on bird populations um, essentially before their migration starts. So uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Rittner here to give us ready for a boot camp for birding. So in terms of how to kind of get started with, you know, getting ready for the actual bird count in a couple of weeks, um, this is something I'm going to be doing with my classes. I'm going to walk you through the exact same boot camp they're going to go through starting on Wednesday. And I would start by familiarizing yourself with some of the common species in our area. But again, you got to kind of be open to meeting some new friends. So these are some pictures we took last year when we were out with the kids um, on the football field, 6 a.m., you know, on the first day of the bird count. But we had a red-tailed hawk kind of passing through the area, some starlings in the tree. Uh, that in the middle there, that is a, um, that's the winter plumage for a, uh, I'm blanking on the name, Mr. Red. Oh, sorry, red, red winged blackbird. That's a red winged blackbird. Yeah. Thank you. Without the red. <laughs> and the uh, American gold finch on the right. But we did link, I, that's the PowerPoint I used for class with some of the more common species in the area. Uh, it's a good idea to get used to not only what they look like, but also be on the listen for what they sound like. Uh, particularly some of the notable except, notable species would be that something like a northern cardinal that sounds like a laser beam firing. It sounds silly, but you'll never forget it now. I'd also encourage you to kind of read up on the Great Backyard Bird Count by going to their website, which is linked there. 
and also getting familiarized with some of the rules, which we'll walk you through on the next couple of slides. Uh, so we did link the introductory video there. Maybe we can skip that just for time's sake, but it's just a short one minute video, an animation that kind of illustrates the basic purpose of the uh, Great Backyard Bird Count. Again, in order to participate, it's pretty low commitment. You just need to participate. In order uh, to, to participate, you're just going to commit to collecting data for at least 15 minutes on one or more days from the 12th to the 15th this month. So you could spend as little as 15 minutes. You could spend as much as four days. Remember, the best time to view birds is in the early morning with the rise of the sun. You're thinking between 6 and 8 o'clock a.m. You know, that's why we went out there really early last year and we spent the morning yelling at the kids for forgetting their gloves because we had to give them up. Um, always count, and this is, this is a, probably one of the more important rules here, you always count the maximum number of birds of the same species you see in a given area. Uh, and this is because birds may leave the area and then return. You don't want to be overestimating the number of birds. You can quickly reach astronomical numbers of 800 when really it was just, you know, four or five birds just passing through the area if you're not paying attention. So as an example of that, um, imagine, you know, you're, we're seeing seven red-winged blackbirds at 11 o'clock, which all leave by 11.05. At 11.15, you count eight, uh, eight red-winged blackbirds. You'd enter the number eight down, not 15. You would not be adding a running total. You would just add the largest number you saw during your observation period. However, if at 11.20, you happen to count uh, 15 red-winged blackbirds, you would adjust the number for the count from eight to 15, but you wouldn't up that to now 30. Again, it's not a running total, it's the most birds you see at any sort of given time. Um, another important thing here is sometimes you'll be able to hear a bird, but perhaps not see it. One of the rules is you can count that and you would mark that with an X to indicate the species was present, but you couldn't get an accurate number of how many individuals were in the area. Uh, one thing I always encourage students is to record your notes on a piece of paper in your notebook prior to submitting your finalized results via eBird. Um, that's just because sometimes you want to change your number, you made a mistake. For class, we need that data too, so it's always important to have a hard copy somewhere. But you want to remember that eBird is geotagged, so you want to submit your results at the location where you collected your data and made the observations, or going through the website and kind of manually plugging in where you were. All right, you always kind of kind of keep that in mind. Um, in terms of you know where can you go, certainly your backyard is a great option. It's called the Great Backyard Bird Count for a reason. But you can also go to other areas. We can go to local parks like Brookside. Uh, you can look at Fanwood Nature Center, Watchung Reservation is another one, although it's very very uh, busy there usually. You can go to the Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, in a normal year, the Finsky Visitor Center uh, in the sort of the northwestern corner of the park, they do an excellent job. They have staff available to kind of aid you with identifying birds. They have bird feeders out there. I'm not sure they're going to be open this year, but certainly that's an option uh, to just go and, and uh, explore the National Wildlife Refuge for, for birds. You can also think about going to the Raptor Trust, although you know you really you're not supposed to be counting the birds you might see in the exhibit cages, the uh, the so-called um, ambassador birds, and also the Raptor Trust is pretty much locked down at this time. You kind of have to go out on your own. And uh, we'll also give a shout out to the Sherman Hoffman Wildlife Sanctuary. Uh, there's an Audubon you know center there, and that's where we took the kids last year to kind of get trained on how to actually go and and um, do birding and practice with binoculars and stuff. Unfortunately, they are also closed at the moment due to COVID, but you can certainly walk the grounds. I've been there a few times during the pandemic. It's a really, really nice spot, and they usually have the bird feeders going all, the, all year round, so you know you'll be able to see at least some birds in the wild. How can I learn more? So um, yeah, uh, there's there's tons and it, it's 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 limitless. Um, so we prepared at the end of the presentation just a couple of slides that that can help you begin your search on how to uh, how to learn more. Uh, I love this picture. I actually um, I was at a at a um, next generation science standards workshop and that's where I was introduced to it uh, when we when we uh, 
when we share information, we need to be precise, but biology to a physicist is just bird, but uh, it's funny. All right, anyway, uh, use a variety of metrics to help you identify birds. Uh, look at them as a group, understand uh, the behavior, the shape, size, coloration, field markings. The more you observe them, the more you draw things, the more you label things, the more it's gonna stick out, all right? You really wanna be an active participant whenever possible. Um, the more you engage, the better you'll be. Uh, All About Birds is another resource that I like to use. So Mr. Rittner creates a resource for his um, for his students for environmental. I create my own. Um, and that's something you can do, too, is uh, you create your own study materials, uh, create your own study guide, create your own presentations to help you uh, start to learn them. All About Birds is a really nice resource. It's almost like an encyclopedia. Uh, they have bird calls, pictures, uh, data sheets, uh, where you can expect to find them. And they also have, um, it's not through All About Birds, I believe, but there's a list of quizzes that you can take uh, on bird calls and identification. If I find myself with like a few uh, minutes, I will hop onto one of those and see how I do. Uh, but some of them are really hard. So you gotta, you gotta study. Um, birding by ear, um, tons of resources. Um, I know Cornell's Ornithology Lab had a sale a couple of weeks ago. You could buy their entire MP3 collection uh, for 20 bucks. And you know, I, you know, I spent that. It was totally worth it. Uh, but I have the, uh, the entire repertoire now. And if I need to know like what a white-throated sparrow sounds like, again, like you want to come up with mnemonics, but that one's uh, Oh Sweet Canada. That's uh, a good one. Uh, and there's also a game called Bird Song Hero. We all remember Guitar Hero. Uh, well, try out Bird Song Hero and it'll uh, teach you how to read spectrograms, uh, which could aid you in uh, identifying uh, birds out in the field. Um, you can watch birds from all over the world. So uh, the Cornell Feeder Watch, uh, Cornell uh, Lab, uh, we can play this for just a second here. You can see it's dark out, but it is still snowing for sure. Um, and I like to show this for the beginning of my zoo class. Every once in a while, we'll just watch a bird cam for a couple minutes and um, just see what, what's happening there. Um, there. Again, they have these set up all over the world. You can check them out and uh, give it a watch one day. It's kind of soothing. All right. Uh, Nature Journal, I mentioned earlier, um, John Weir Laws did a series through the Audubon Society, and he's a very prominent naturalist, very, very, very well engaged with uh, education. Um, you can visit his website with the link there. He also has a series of, I believe, they're up to six now on how to draw birds. Absolutely spectacular. Absolutely spectacular series. Each episode is like an uh, hour and a half to two hours. He walks you step by step and step. Uh, how you can use behaviors, how you can use field markings, techniques, everything. I, I just found myself in awe that he volunteered himself to, uh, to do this kind of stuff because it's, it's something I've been able to work with my students on this year. How do you become a better uh, steward of the environment? How do you, how do you engage more? And again, just every, every kid can be creative. Uh, every adult can be creative. Uh, foster that creativity. All right. Oop, that's where I left off on that episode. Let's go. <laughs> Next thing. Uh, there's my nature journaling. So this was done on the, the first snow. So I drew some sparrows, uh, my white-throated sparrow and my song sparrow. I even drew a little junko there. Um, I, was, I was having some questions there. Like, why, why are they running around hopping in the snow? Uh, there was some that kept falling into the same hole. And I, I was questioning that behavior a little bit. But, you know, it's just something that, that you can do there. Um, and it, it helps you to helps you to really engage. Oh, there, there's my uh, birds fall in holes uh, underneath the, the tail of the, uh, of the song sparrow. So they weren't doing it as much today, but it was still uh, present. Uh, if you have kids at home and you want and you want to do something with with kids, uh, they have a whole new thing that was launched a couple of a couple of months ago. Uh, maybe it was a rebranding of it, but they did talk a lot about Audubon's for kids. Tons of activities to do. You can draw birds, games, crafts, whatever. It's there. Uh, engage the next generation. Uh, birds and Media. This is my favorite podcast series. Um, once a month, they get together uh, people from Audubon Society. It's like a talk show podcast all fused in one. Um, they have a number of guest speakers, topics, and updates. Episode 17 should be coming out uh, in a couple of weeks. You can register for it and watch it live, or you can watch previous episodes on YouTube by following that link. Uh, birds and books. Over the quarantine the last couple of months, I've read four books that I really enjoy. Uh, Kingbird Highway, Genius of Birds, Thing with Feathers, How to Know the Birds. Um, good stuff. And I'm sure the, the, the Scotch Plains Library has even more resources that I just haven't had a chance to, to get my hands on yet. But you can read about them too. Uh, other resources, BirdCast, Ask Ken, and BirdNote, they're just more resources for you to engage with birding as a whole. Um, and then uh, Mr. Rittner here included some, uh, he included, I believe, 
oh no, his slide shows in an earlier slide. No, it's, it's there, it's there, common SPF birds. So you can see how he did that, uh, how to make recycled bird feeders, pine cone feeders, and then a, a, a cute little what's your bird name uh, activity. All right. Um, when you have access to this presentation, um, you can uh, practice out by, uh, by plugging into Merlin Bird ID, but I just wanted to quick close out uh, and I have the answer key there for everyone too. So you can practice getting used to Merlin Bird ID with some exemplars. Uh, and yeah, so thank you for coming, enjoy your birding. And then Mr. Rittner, if you wanna quick throw a plug out for your, uh, for your activity there. Oh yeah, sure. So, so very, very quickly, um, I, I, I co-run the uh, environmental club at the high school. We, uh, we're working with an organization called Tree Punish. Um, we calculated uh, that um, every year the school is cutting down the equivalent of 240 trees to meet its paper needs for the high school. And so we're trying to basically sell uh, saplings for the community to plant in their, in their homes or parks or wherever. Well, in your homes, don't go around in, par in parks and do that. Uh, leave that to us. But um, you can actually scan the QR code on the poster there the kids made. It takes you to the student website and you can order from one of three different types of trees. You have Eastern Redbud, Red Maple and River Birch. I know I've already ordered a couple of uh, red maples to plant on campus and someday I'll teach myself how to do some maple sugaring. But uh, yeah, if it's something of interest to you, uh, by all means sign up. If not, it's just a really cool opportunity to talk, to think about, you know, supporting your local community, reducing your carbon footprint, improving your local uh, biodiversity, and of course my favorite, the ecosystem services. So I just wanted to give that a quick plug. Thanks for letting me do that. Yeah. All right, so. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Ritter and Mr. Rittner, thank you so much. You covered so much information, but I think you made everything very clear for us about how we can uh, start to prepare to participate in this great citizen science project. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, let me add the library, the Scotch Plains Public Library. We do have copies of the, uh, the Sibley Guide, the Peterson Guides, and uh, some Nat Geo Guides. So those are available to borrow uh, by contact-free pickup uh, once the library gets dug out from under the snow, <laughs> that service will resume. So we'd be happy to uh, provide you uh, with copies of those books. Uh, we also have a fantastic book called The Field Guide to Citizen Science, if you really wanna read up a little bit about the movement and why it's so important and, and really fun to participate in, uh, I also recommend that as well. Um, if we have a few minutes to stick around there, I know there have been a few, well, there's a lot of uh, thank yous and great presentation uh, comments in the chat. Um, somebody did have a question asking, uh, have there been issues uploading photos, I guess, to the eBird using Safari on a Mac? I'm not sure if that's something you can, you're familiar with. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't personally upload my, my photos. My only suggestion would just be to check to make sure that you are uploading as either a PNG file or a JPEG file. Uh, if you're trying to upload from an iPhone, they use that HEIC file type and that, that interferes with some um, web uploads. Uh, they should have a, uh, a contact number. Uh, so if you are having issues, you can reach, reach out directly to the organization. They can help out with that. Great, yeah. Okay, and so also, as we said, uh, we will make sure that everybody gets a copy of the slide so that you can access all of these links that were um, discussed. And uh, again, we have recorded this presentation, um, so it should be pretty soon uploaded to the library's YouTube channel. So I will make sure that you get sent notification and a link to access that. All right. Yes. I'm gonna stop.